as we are still in the topic of graphics components, it's worth highlighting all the works that Default made for the rendering pipelines and shaders development in 2024. Default detects and supports half float and float texture formats on OpenGL S2.0 and WebGL 1.0 now, so devices with it can now render floating point textures if they support the necessary extensions. This adds compatibility for 16-bit and 32-bit float textures on older devices. Default vastly improved memory usage in large projects, allowing for more efficient builds in resource-heavy projects, especially during rendering-related processes, and improved such things like error reporting for shader compilation. Default throughout the whole 2024 made a lot of changes related to their cross-platform GLFW pipeline backend, starting with wrapping it up in a new engine platform library, removing custom GLFW library they were using from the engine, and replaced it with GLFW 2.7, migrating the current version to the latest stable official release, as well as separating all non-desktop platforms of the infrastructure, then moving all platforms from GLF2 to GLF3.4 for all from Mac to Windows. Migrating to GLFW3 spanned through the whole year but in the end helped solving a lot of platform specific problems related to window management, window content scaling, application lifecycle, input management and screen specifics such as flickering, wrong update frequency and many others. Big thing is the addition of compute shaders. Compute shaders are a type of shader program that runs on the GPU and is specifically designed for general purpose parallel computation. Unlike traditional shaders like Vertex and Fragment programs in default, which are used in graphics pipelines to render images, compute shaders are not restricted to rendering tasks. They allow developers to leverage the GPU's massive parallel processing power for a wide range of computations. Main work on the support for them was delivered in parts and spanning from 1.8.0 to 1.9.0, which included the first technical preview. A compute program is similar to a material. You can specify constants and samplers in the resource itself, as well as use certain render API functions to bind textures and constants. However, there is no logical connection to a game object. Everything related to a computer program happens in a render script and there is no editor preview. Compute shaders unlock the raw computational power of the GPU, enabling very complex tasks like simulating advanced physics, generating procedural content, artificial intelligence or just handling heavy parallel workloads. Compute shaders are available in the most powerful game engines and used in sophisticated games like Far Cry 6, utilizing their Dunia engine. If you are interested in them, check out the great talk by Lou Kramer from Games Industry Conference 2021. I'll put the link to the recording in the description. In April, Vulkan backend was finally enabled for Linux platform. It came along with many other small improvements and fixes, such as for example a possibility to disable vSync in Vulkan. The shader support in default received a major update. Default processes engine shaders using a pipeline approach and currently supports two configurations, the new pipeline and the legacy pipeline. The legacy pipeline operates as follows, accepts ES2 compatible GLSL code as input, transform the shader source into AS3 OpenGL3 versions primarily through the regular expressions and optionally cross-compiles the GL3 code into SPIRV for Vulkan. This setup presents though some issues. The engine relies on outdated GLS code. While most modern resources move forward, each uniform is stored in its own uniform buffer, which is highly inefficient. Transformation from ES2 to ES3 is fragile due to use of regular expressions, and in the end the GLS code is unoptimized. The new shader pipeline uses SPIRV as a base. Therefore, the shaders written in GLSL version 140 as input are accepted, and further optimized and then generated in any required language or version for WebGL, HLSL, Metal or others. The new pipeline therefore produces optimized shaders even for older GLSL versions and uses many advancements like enabling the engine to use constant buffers, allowing all uniforms to be packed into a single
global buffer, which can be updated in one operation instead of individually. To take advantage of this new setup, shaders must be written in at least GLS version 140, as required by the Spear V toolchain. However, it's not necessary to rewrite existing shaders to maintain game functionality. Existing shaders will still work, but to unlock the benefits and new features, they need to be updated to the newer GLSL version. Default redesign the camera component. First, introducing wrappers to acquire or release camera focus of given cameras with camera API instead of messages. But then introduced features like automatic focus acquisition and better integration with rendering script. This is a subtle change in behavior because previously you needed to acquire camera focus by sending a proper message. Now all cameras will be enabled and updated automatically until you actively send an unacquired camera focus message or use go set camera disable to disable them. It's a workflow improvement and additionally all scripts can now access the camera namespace which includes several functions for controlling cameras. With new function camera.getCameras you can now get all currently available cameras. And you can get and set different properties of a given camera like aspect ratio, field of view, near and far planes, orthographic zoom and so on. Render API has also been adjusted and has a new function render.setCamera which can be used in a render script to automatically use the view and projection matrices from the enabled camera in the next draw call, which simplifies writing render pipeline a lot. And because camera's frustums are visible in the editor, this really simplifies understanding of what will you see when running the game. Therefore, the whole built-in render script was refactored also for camera to have precedence and you can also call camera get enabled to check the currently used camera. So my videos about render scripts are deprecated mostly and I need to update it. So now is a great time to smash that like and subscribe button to motivate me to do so finally. The spine and drive extensions for default were updated several times in 2024 with features and fixes, so they keep it up to date all the time and not only this. They added a clipping feature for spine models and later on updated to spine 4.2. For Rive, a support for mobile Android for ARM64 and web for WebGL2 version was added, while Windows and Linux were already supported. This was a major release that introduced a shift from the custom default Rive render backend to the native Rive renderer. This means that default no longer manages its own rendering layer for Rive animations, but instead relies entirely on the Rive libraries to handle rendering and enhances stability across Rive versions and significantly reduces the maintenance workload on default side. If we are on the topic of updates, maintaining a game engine is all about supporting the newest technology. I mentioned updates to the rendering backend, updated extensions, default is constantly doing the work to support newest platforms, operating systems and align with providers' requirements. Default was updated to the latest Xcode, iOS and macOS, ensuring compatibility with the latest Apple SDKs. For Android, they updated to SDK 34 and set target SDK version to 34, ensuring compatibility with modern Android versions. For web, they upgraded to mscripten 3.1.5, enhancing performance in HTML builds and preparing for the future web GPU support because, yes, default began experimental support for the web GPU graphics API to provide a modern and efficient shader execution environment for web platforms. This initiative is part of default efforts to stay at the front of web-based graphics technologies. The updates to Windows and Linux platforms were described mainly when we talked about rendering pipeline upgrades and were regarding the GLFW support. For console support, I was already covering this in my videos, but 2024 was a year of introducing the official PS5 support. And if you are an approved console developer, it is available for you for free. You can now access the necessary tools, documentation and source code to build games for PS5 using default. Several games were released on Nintendo Switch and Refold is one of the publishers of the games there. Default has plans to introduce Xbox support too. The whole groundwork regarding the mentioned rendering pipeline changes and the Wasapi was done in 2024 already, so we are on good tracks, but official support is yet to be announced. If you have a default game that you wish to release on Xbox, 
contact the default team. Besides updating SDKs, the team put a lot of effort into introducing new languages to default. Many programmers complained about the lack of static types in Lua, so default solved it by adding support for Lua transpilers. The first language that can be used to try it is TL, a type dialect of Lua that allows developers to write type-safe logic. The support is currently limited to transpilation only and excludes automatic external generation for default Lua APIs. This means it is more useful for writing type-safe standalone logic than interacting with default runtime, though TL allows writing necessary externs yourself. To test it, you will need to add TL extension to the dependencies to try it out. Beside, the introduced Lua language server allows you to write Lua annotations in comments that can check types in the editor. This is also supported if you are using VS Code to write games code and for me it's a very nice feature, I started using it all the time in all my projects. In 1.9.0 they bundled the Lua language server directly into the default editor. This provides features such as linting and syntax checking, eliminating the need to use the LSP extensions separately. There is also a community annotations extension for TL as well. But this version introduced also something really important and groundbreaking, a pure C API headers that are a part of an ongoing effort to enable c -sharp support. And yes, while it wasn't announced in 2004, this year we have now, alongside existing support for C++, the official support for c -sharp 2. Note that this is a support to write native extension in c -sharp, but as proven, it can be done to make even whole games. I hope all those updates satisfy a lot of developers that were looking for static typing for their project, or their favorite language support at least to some degree. You can check out more about c -sharp support in the Games from Scratch video. Eight years ago, Default revolutionized game development with its extension system and cloud builders on AWS enabling developers to integrate third-party services and platform-specific features without relying on the default team or additional tools. In 2024, Default overhauled its build server infrastructure, splitting servers into platform-specific instances for better scalability and migrating from AWS to Google Cloud Platform. This move simplifies server setup, reduces costs, and allows users to easily create their own build server using public container registries. While build servers remain free, they cost over 1000 euro monthly to maintain. If you rely on them, please consider supporting the default foundation via GitHub sponsors, Patreon or PayPal. Now let's move on to further enhancement to default regarding audio. Default standardized the sample rate for the HTML5 audio context to 44100 Hz to ensure compatibility and consistent playback on various devices. Previously, sample rates varied by device, causing playback issues. They also enhanced the Sound that Stop API to allow stopping individual sounds. Developers can now specify the play ID of a sound to stop it without affecting others, enabling finer control over audio playback. Default added functionality to validate OGG sound files from mounted extensions by copying resources to temporary files. And directly in the default editor, reducing runtime errors caused by invalid audio files and ensuring compatibility during the build process and fix several other sound related issues. In 1.9.0, default introduced retry settings for downloading audio assets in HTML5 builds configurable through game.project. And as mentioned, default replaced the old OpenEL implementation for audio handling with Vasapi library that is crucial to allow reuse of the backend for the Xbox platform. With this change, they no longer ship the OpenAL files, thus making the build size again a bit smaller. There's already a ton of features and we have yet a lot of them to discuss. If you are still with me, let's see what was added to improve live updates and collections management in default. First, they added leave update mount on start checkbox in game.project to enable or disable automatic resource mounting, allowing manual control of resource management. 
Default added possibility to load collection proxies and spawn factories from C++. This adds more functionality to the C++ SDK, which is part of the effort to allow developers to write the game logic using C++. Default added function collection proxy set collection to replace collections for excluded collection proxies. This functionality is used in live update and is designed to simplify the management of resources loaded using the live update features. Bob, which is a building program for default, calculates how many game objects are used by each collection. If the collection has no factory or collection factory component, this value is used to allocate the exact number of game objects for the world. Otherwise, collection max instances is used. Not related maybe to collections nor leaf updates, but a lot of data in games is saved in JSON and default also added controls to configure how Lua tables are encoded into JSON and how JSON is decoded back into Lua, such as encoding empty Lua tables as objects or arrays. Now let's move on to physics. Default now has a physics that set listener function to receive all physics events, collisions triggers, and handle them in a single function. Note that if the listener is set, physics messages will, will no longer be sent. This addition can vastly change how physics are handled in complex code right now. Moreover, this release brought up even more features for physics like functions to get and set shape, allowing to dynamically change collision shape sizes in runtime or a function update mass to dynamically change mass of a dynamic 2D collision object in the physics world. The function recalculates the density of each shape based on the total area of all shapes and the specified mass, then updates the mass of the body accordingly. And it's not over. There is also a new type for physics joints, joint type wheel, which can be used to create rotation connections different from motor type, more suited for, well, wheels. I must admit, in terms of physics improvements, this release was astonishing, just to surprise you a bit later with a, a totally new module called B2D, to access Box2D API directly for physics manipulation via Lua scripts. This exposes the Box2D API and thus enables developers to manipulate physics bodies, forces, velocities and other Box2D properties directly through Lua. It's a vast module, so refer to the API for more information. Of course, it comes with a possibility to exclude physics from engine. You have now new options in App Manifest to exclude 2D or 3D physics or both or none. Beside, multiple bugs were fixed and as mentioned, for change, the rotate or flip tiles in tile maps, the collisions are working properly too, or contact points returning actual contact points correctly. Many other things should have been mentioned in this video, new APIs, better error handling, performance improvements and quality of life and user experience features, but it's already very very long and I believe it gives you an overall look into new default features and improvements. Releasing software each month is a challenge in itself. Default introduced numerous improvements and new features on a regular basis, however its frequent but incremental updates may not create the same sense of awesomeness as other engines that release in non-systematic ways at different times but unveil large game-changing features. Half of the list of release notes are always bug fixes, so bear in mind that the team behind Default is keeping an arm on Pulse to give you the most stable and reliable solution. Default team grew in size and I'm proud to announce here that I joined Refold, a company that is contributing to Default and consists of developers making games in Default as part of the publishing and porting business to secure stability. And I'm precisely in Refold to port games using Default, so I'm very excited to finally be a part of this amazing ecosystem that I've been in love with for a few years now. It's really been a while. And the future looks great, so thank you for bearing with me through the whole video, or at least the parts you were interested in. Happy defaulting!